it's Thursday, 4.20 p.m. Eastern. That means it's time for office hours, Arroyo's mm-hmm. weekly session for cultivators to hear from the experts and talk to each other about what we're seeing in their grows. Hello, hello. My name is Mandy, and I'll be holding down the show with Seth today. A couple of quick announcements as we get started for episode 35. Arroya is now on TikTok, so be sure to follow us over there for new content that we're always adding to. Um, and also today, if you're joining us live, if you, if you have a question for Seth, you can go ahead and add that to the chat at any time. We'll have you unmute yourself so you can ask him and start the discussion. First time question askers get Arroya swag and everyone on today will have a chance to win a limited edition Arroya shirt. So be sure to type your email in, address in our chat to enter. That's limited to U.S. residents and one winner per household. Seth, how's it going? Not too bad, Mandy. Nice to see you today. Awesome. Yeah, it's so good to see you again. Um, yeah, so we had a couple of questions come in this week and we have a couple of topics that we thought we'd cover. So um yeah, without further ado, you guys want to go ahead and start the show? Sure. Yeah, I thought uh, maybe we just jump right into crop registration and harvest groups and how we kind of handle that in Arroyo and how it can be convenient for growers. In Arroyo, we take, you know, a round, a run, a group of plants that's going through its life cycle together and group them into a harvest group. And what that allows us to do is go back and look at all of the data that we've collected for that harvest group, both current and historical. So, That'll bring it to one spot where I can go back and actually view the entire run all at once, is in terms of data at least. And uh, this this is really important. You know, you want to be able to actually access this data in the future, know where it's at, and not have to spend a bunch of time digging around spreadsheets, different files that may not be connected, binders. It's all over the place. I can hop in here and go, okay. Here is my data from that entire run in terms of water EC. I can look at all the sensor values that I can normally look at on my graph in the room dashboard. And I can actually even add manual values on here if I wanted to, such as stem diameter, node spacing, plant height. So that's kind of how we group all of the crop registration together. So we can look at, for instance, plant height or stem diameter here. Each of these points, it's growing. Um, These are all really important factors when we're looking at optimizing our crops over time and for the future. So we want to have this data. We want to look at it and we want to make a point to analyze it in a way that uh, is going to be helpful for us. So we've got a, uh, you know, this great view of the data here. And we also have an analytics section that you can look at and start to dial in, you know, things like, well, what was the yield like? What was, uh, how, how was I able to match my target range goals here? For instance, if I looked at water content, you know, we see this all the time in rock wool. If you're, uh, this is not actually good data. It's just some demo data to populate the screen. But if we were in rock wool and your graph looked like this below range for a lot of your harvest, you're going to notice a decrease in yield. So we can start to look at things like that. And over time, as you build up more of these harvest groups, you have more and more data to look back on and start to, you know, apply some statistical models to, to make decisions. And then at the bottom here, we've got our dry weight. Now, what this really allows us to do is, you know, every day as a grower, we should be in there taking measurements. So when I go in, every time I mix up a tank of feed solution, I'm going to take the EC for that. I'm going to take the pH. Then I want to get runoff EC and pH, you know, ideally at least on one example of every strain I have in the room every day. What harvest groups allows me to do is take all these manual readings and group them into a place. Like I'm not now going to have to go back for flower one and find a a date range, you know, years from now, if I want to go back and look at this data and see how it was doing. But it's really, really, I mean, I know we stress it a lot on this show, but you have to really have to quantify what's going on with your plants and put it into a format that you can analyze. Otherwise it's really hard to make choices. And a lot of the times if you're not, if you're not looking back at your last whole run or previous whole runs and starting to connect, you know, hey, here's where we had this problem. Here's where we had that problem. And here's what the finished product looked like. Um, if you can't look back and try to take a holistic approach, it's going to be not futile, but very difficult and, you know, long, a difficult and long process trying to make a bunch of small changes without looking back and going, OK, how exactly did those work? Um were there other variables at play that we're not looking at right now that we just forgot about? Cause I know, you know, at least for me, 
you get 60 plus runs deep into growing at a single facility. And, you know, a lot of the times you might have grown the same strand 60 times at that point or a hundred times. If that's the case, you know, you want to be able to look back and find actually good information. You know, we, some people, I, I don't have a photographic memory. Some photos stay in there, <laughs> but I certainly am not as efficient at cataloging and storing information as my computer is. That's for sure. And to create our harvest group, it's actually a really simple process. I um, always encourage all of our clients to keep up with that. But we'll just go through a little demonstration of kind of what it looks like using tags, using metric tags. Um, if you don't, if you're not in a metric state or you're not using the metric version of our software, that's okay. Much of this process is still the same. So when we go to start creating a harvest group, we're going to pick our recipe. Go ahead. Then pick each room. And what that's going to allow Arroyo to do is know where to pull sensor data for a specific plant or set of plants. Pick our flower room and then all the, ideally follow it all the way through dry. Because the other thing we're going to capture in here is hopefully if you know we're staying on top of it, any changes from the standard recipe in terms of task timing, uh, how long we're you know drying for, any kind of small change, we can uh, record that as well and have it for the future. So now what I'm doing in here is I'm just going to grab or scan the mom tag. Go ahead and grab a plant tag for my clone lot. And go ahead and create some clones. Now I'll go to pl plan rooms. In this case, I'm going to monocrop this room. So uh, it probably doesn't matter. That's it. And for the flower room, I'll actually go ahead and, in this case, pick multiple zones because each of these zones is going to have the same cultivar in it. Go ahead, pick our dry room, and then hit review and finish. And now we've created a record and repository in order to find all of that data in the future. And then, you know, we can change the name. You can say instead of F2, 825, that's just generating for flower two in a date range. That could be run number 22 for you. That could be, you know, crop, harvest, any, any name you want. But once it's created, you've kicked off your recipe. And now all of the um, tasks that you put into the recipe, all of your parameters will be represented as this harvest group schedule. And as you move along, it's going to automatically start populating your tasks in the journal and then roll out your light schedule and the target ranges that you established in your recipe. Um, I find that most growers move forward in their evolution as a grower much more quickly once they really start implementing, you know, a comprehensive crop registration system that's easy to use. You know, if we're not tracking as much as we possibly can, we've got blind spots in our system and that's not something you want. Yeah. It's all about reducing all of those, uh, you know, dialing in on all of your variables and uh, yeah, this sounds great. So what are some of the biggest issues that you've seen clients uh, facing when setting up these like harvest groups and kind of getting set up in the beginning? Um, well, one thing that is tempting is to actually go into the room dashboard and set your parameters here. So if I want to set my target ranges, I can do that in this room, in this uh, page, but what, if I do it on this dashboard, I'm going to have to go reset those target ranges every time that, you know, we cross that point. So if we're switching from generative to vegetative, our water content changes, our EC goals change, I would have to go in and manually do this. When I set up this recipe, which is our, uh, we have some pre-built ones, but obviously we encourage you to fill it out and really build out what your own recipe looks like. And what it is, is just a, um, a workflow. It's a calendar that you can apply to any harvest group you want. And, uh, we'll just go ahead and, uh, look at one of these examples here. So if we go in, we've got a prop phase clone 14 days. I can set a light scheduler targets. I have not for that one. Vegetative, we've got that vegetative phase. That's going to tell Arroyo where to pull uh, sensor data from veg for that time range. 
while it's there. And we can also add our target ranges when we get into flower. This is where, um, a lot of people will spend a lot of time with these target ranges because it's dynamic. You know, we have multiple changes for each of these parameters throughout the run. So what I can do is say, okay, in early flower generative run in rock wool, we'll go the 20% dry back on this one. And then here is actually one thing um, where especially people who <clears throat> haven't had much formal training with the software tend to kind of slip up a little bit, or how should I say stumble with a little bit of annoyance. Um, if you check this box here, that's just going to send you an alert when it goes outside of these parameters. What I like to do and find to be the most beneficial for growers is for every target range I set. I look at the target range as my analytical target range. What do I want to, you know, accomplish ideally? And then I also know, you know, looking at my graphs, what my facility can accomplish. Um, let's say that I'm, you know, a little bit worried that my irrigation system is plugging up lately. Well, I don't want to get an alert at four in the morning <clears throat> if it goes down to 44% and I was shooting for 45. I can correct that the next day with my feed schedule. That's just going to get me in the bad habit of annoying some of those alerts. But if I go down here and say, okay, let's just set this at 39. That is 6% below where my goal was. That's far enough for me to consider that, you know, maybe I've got an HVAC problem. Maybe I've got an irrigation problem. Maybe a lot, you know, that last P2 didn't fire off because the solenoid failed. That's an action item. <clears throat> Another great example is temperature. You know, plants are really happy if we can hold that 80 to 82. And, you know, you can go a little higher up to 85. Sure. There's no doubt there. But, you know, if I set that alert on because let's say I want to know if I go out of that range too far or if, you know, my heater breaks or well, we're at the end of summer here in Eastern Washington. Now, if my AC unit breaks, I want to know, but <clears throat> let's say in my case, and a lot of growers out there who are in some retrofitted facilities, you know, if your insulation's not on point, you've got some leaks, some drafts, you've got just efficiency issues in the building or equipment broke. Um, let's say, you know, that, all right, typically we can maintain not 80 to 82, but 75 to 84. You know, that's a pretty good range that we're able to keep it in all day. That's not ideal. Um, but as a grower, I'm, I'm aware of it and I just don't want my phone getting texts, you know, every 30 minutes as we cross these thresholds up and down. So what I'm going to do is go in and say, all righty, since I know it's not holding those two degrees, I'm going to set my alert max for 90 because that tells me for sure that my AC is broken. And then my minimum I'll say about 70 because around here in the winter time in my grow room, that would mean that at this part of the phase, early flower generative, my, my heater went out and I need to fix that too. And then when we're done with that, we'll hit apply changes and you can add these ranges for, you know, <clears throat> any parameter you want that we measure. I will say, um, I always warn people on the alerts, you know, pick, pick action items. So, you know, if we're talking about EC, for instance, I do have an analytical target range for EC, depending on the phase. Let's say right now I'm in the, uh, reload there. Let's just say we're going to be in I'll set a pretty wide range. I'm not going to set up an alert for EC. I'm going to watch that every day, but because I know that if I over dry, 2% compared to where I did yesterday, I could get a pretty big um, response in terms of EC on the graph. And I know that that one over slight over drying is maybe not going to hurt the plant terribly, but again, I don't want to set it up. So I'm getting so many uh, alerts that I just start to ignore it. Yeah, I could definitely see that, but it's really giving you that visibility um, that you've been needing uh, as a grower Oh yeah. um, and then, and then the control with everything too. So Mm -hmm. And it's just, you know, there's, there's a, a whole host of tools in here. And, uh, I definitely find for, especially some of the smaller and mid-sized growers that have a limited staff and, you know, everyone knows there's only 24 hours in a day and you got to sleep sometime. That's the biggest thing is, you know, going in and setting up this initial recipe and getting all of their tasks into it. And one thing I find too, is like, you know, the first time I set up a recipe, I probably got about 50, 60% of my tasks in there because, 
there was a whole suite of tasks that I do that I, I've done it enough times. I don't really have to think about my scheduling on some of the, some of those things, or just, you know, <clears throat> little maintenance items that you do every day or every week that you've just always done. You haven't necessarily, <clears throat> I know in my case, I hadn't written it out for someone before. I just, you know, wrote it on a calendar once or twice. So one thing you can do in that case is go into your harvest group as it's moving along. So it's currently growing. And I can hop into, let's say this, uh, we're almost done with this run here. I can hop in there and go, okay, I actually made some changes on when I flipped from veg to gen on these strains or when I times a certain tasks, I can go into the schedule, record those changes by changing the schedule and save it. But one cool thing is if you have like, let's say a base recipe and you made a slight tweak one run and you're like, wow, that really seemed to be the key, you know, that took us to the next level. I can go ahead and save the schedule as a recipe. I don't have to go in and rebuild a schedule because let's say you've got, you know, by the time you've got all of your targets and alerts in there, your light schedule, and let's say, you know, every single task you had to do for a whole run, you're going to have quite a bit of time in here as far as putting stuff, putting in tasks and alerts. So you don't want to have to re, uh, recreate that every single time. You just want to be able to copy and modify it. And that's what you can do here. That's awesome. Cool. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you have any questions about it, Mandy? I mean, we can kind of get a little deeper into it. That's about, that's a really good overview though. Of just, it's a, the harvest groups are a place to compile your data, bring everything together and uh, view it in the future. And that includes your yields too. After you uh, are in your harvest, after you have your harvest groups going, if you are in the non-metric version of Arroyo, you will uh, have a yields tab right here. In the metric integrated version, we have inventory. But the cool thing is once you start to populate your weights, which if you're metric integrated, that's going to happen as long as you use the uh, harvesting and drying flows. But once that weight's populated, now we can look back and start comparing side by side runs, like how, what, what were they like for weight? What strains were in there? What recipe did we run? And start looking at, you know, start comparing everything in kind of a holistic way rather than just saying, oh, we're just looking at yield. And now it takes us 10 minutes to dig up this other data that we needed to know about this to make a choice. It's all right here. If I see one I like, I can just go ahead, click into it. That's going to take me back to the harvest group environment page and tell me how many of each plan I have and what my data looked like. No, this is awesome. I think it was just a general overview of, of harvest groups um, for me. And I think that we really got to touch on a lot of different things uh, for setting up, uh, setting up for first time users and everything. So um, are, is there anything else that you think that our clients could use Um that maybe you haven't seen them use in harvest groups yet or, uh, you know, honestly, a big one is if you don't have the uh, uh, metric integrated version of Arroyo utilizing the yields tab in harvest groups to keep track of your yields. And I get that because it's an extra step. And as, a, as a producer, you've already had to put that data into either metric or another database anyways, but that is uh that's a big one that people somehow seem to not find the time to do. And like I said, it, it seems to vary, you know, um, there's a wide range of workloads that all of our clients have from, you know, mo only management, their part time to doing all of it from scrubbing the floors to <laughs> doing compliance, you know, so. Oh, yeah. People are wearing mini hats out there. Yep. Well, this is awesome. And yeah, I think it's it all just comes down to trying to consolidate um, things into the platform and make sure that you can see everything together and streamlining everything. Um, this is amazing. Thank you, Seth. Uh, we did have a couple of questions that came in through the chats over on YouTube in the meantime. So we can go ahead and pop on over to those. Yeah. Awesome. So Diane wrote in. Can you ask uh, Seth, what's the benefits of condensed molasses? Um, so what cannabis, uh, so, it, so the $1,200 per five gallon cannabis, so, let me ask this again, I'm sorry. Can you ask Seth what the benefits of condensed molasses and hydroponic, AKA cocoa and perlite would be? They're talking about cannabis, the $1,200 five gallon cannabis. 
Yeah. So molasses products are great in, uh, you know, what growers out there tend to call living soil applications. It's also something you would use in your outdoor garden when you have a really healthy microbial biome going on in there. So in hydroponic applications, uh, unfortunately, no, that's a big waste of money. You know, usually in our grow rooms, we're trying to keep them clean. If you are running, uh, I mean, number one, that's probably going to plug your emitters up. Uh, number two, if you're not running organics, you're, there's really no point. And we're hitting a point now in the weed industry where it's going to be, cannabis is going to become more like other food commodity, not food, just food, but other, you know, consumable commodities in general. So that means organic certification, right? Hydroponics does not pass organic certification. So if you are, you know, once we hit a point where you need to be certified to claim that, what, what's the point in running that molasses if you, you know, can't get a premium for it, for your product because of it? So, yeah. Yeah. yeah all super important things to keep in mind. That's a lot of money. <laughs> That's a lot of money. Yep. And, and just, you know, your injections or your uh, irrigation system, typically running things like molasses, amino acids, organics, anything that's, uh, if it looks murky after you mix it up, it's going to plug your emitters up. They are not, they were never designed for super high levels of salinity or total dissolved solids. So that's just a reality. That's also why they're a consumable piece, you know, but we also want to get, you know, a few runs out of a set of emitters rather than a uh, half a one. Or, you know, I've heard some horror stories out there using various, especially stuff that had been used, pre, you know, for, for years in like the mid 2000s, the 90s. Now it's just, it, it's too dirty for these precision irrigation systems. There's a better way. We don't have to do it like that anymore. Well, um, yeah, I want to say so there's sticky. nothing wrong with that too. <laughs> you know, organics are great, but it's just a different ball game than most of our indoor growers are playing. For sure. Um, awesome. I think that was a great answer for that. Um, Diane, thanks for writing in. Uh, we did have another question that came in, uh, over the weekend over on TikTok. Um, Seth, do you have any just like tips offhand for pest management, something that people could do today to deal with spider mites? Just quick tips. It might not be the exact solution people need, but what <laughs> have you seen people use out in the fields? Oh, everything from hydrogen peroxide to alcohol to, uh, you know, Azimax, um, Botanigard, again, I mean, we can go down the list of pesticides. Uh, if you've got spider mites, I mean, it depends. Are we talking one place? Usually my solution is going to be to trash the room. And uh, I mean, depending on how bad they are, right? Do we have a small infestation? Is it to the point where we think it's going to ruin the crop? So one thing you can do today Try the H2O2 spray, try the alcohol spray if you don't have access. Um, if you're in early flower, you know, those first two to three weeks, you can get away with spraying some different pyrethrins to deal with it, um, buying some bug bombs. But you've also got to look at, okay, there is a cutoff point when I should not be spraying for a multitude of reasons. You know, I don't want to be spraying. I don't want to fail a pesticides test. So therefore, I'm not going to be using pyrethrins late. I'm not going to use Azimax. And in late flower, one of the best ways to mold your crop out is to get your buds wet. So that's why uh, I don't really care what you're spraying. If you're spraying for powdery mildew, that that's not really going to kill it. <laughs> it. It'll kill a little bit, then it'll just grow right back after the half-life of that pesticide has gone. So when we're talking about spider mites, what you can do, the best thing you can do if you've got them, clean out your facility, you know, especially if you're small, but just be as clean as possible get them out of there and then, you know, look for the holes in your current operations. Like, okay, uh, we're, we just keep dealing with these. I, I can't seem to get them out of the facility. It's like, okay, well, do are they living on your moms? You know, find that repository where they survive in between clean downs and try to work on that. Um, otherwise, yeah, if you've got them, the other thing you can definitely do is uh, dip cuttings and bleach. There's other products too. If you bring them in, don't bring in plants that have media attached to them into your facility. So if you're bringing in new genetics, do not get genetics that are, do not get teen plants that are already rooted out. Or if you do be prepared to do a drench, you know, basically a dunk in a drench solution to make sure you're not bringing in bugs. I mean, that's the, the number one source of all those bugs is letting them in. And unfortunately, cannabis is just as it has all the same pests as pretty much every other product we grow. So they're, they're out there. They're everywhere. 
Ah, they're so annoying, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. Is there like a, like they're definitely available a lot in the summer, but do they ever just end up like going away? Like in the winter, are they not around during certain months? Uh, spider mites typically, once you've got them in a facility, you're going to have to work pretty hard to get them out. Okay. But yeah, depending yeah, yeah. on your location, like uh, spider mites, green peach aphids is a huge one. Those are um, just a common agricultural pest everywhere. So like here, uh, like here on the Palouse, we've got, you know, if you're growing here, you're going to be either in a greenhouse or a building, but surrounded by wheat fields. If there's not a building or a house on it, which there aren't that many of those, it's planted in wheat. Okay. Well, lots of green peach aphids, same there's peas, garbanzo beans. So you'd think like, oh, we're out of town. We don't have, you know, maybe as many problems to deal with, but every time they spray those big fields outdoors, it doesn't just kill the bugs. A lot of them try to escape. And where do they go? The only island of green food that they can crawl to. Ah, you really just have to tackle the problem when you get them, huh? That's ah, annoying. Yep. Yeah, there's no <laughs> shortcuts. Wow, that is no sh- no short no shortcut. Sorry, I get tongue tied. Yeah. Um, we got some people actually commenting over on YouTube. Clean out your equipment too. Um, I, that might be from earlier. Um, this is a question. You might know what this means, Seth. Anything mm-hmm. on ORP or you know what that means? Organic. Anything right. on or ORP, Greg? If you um. Can give us any more context on what ORP means. Uh, I'll make sure I ask that question. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I'm no, not, no, not big on acronyms today. <laughs> no, no, no. There's too many acronyms out there. You guys, um, Welton, Husky, Bilbo, do you guys have any questions for today's show? It's a little quiet in the chats. Come on, you guys. You, you guys are going to make me keep talking about pest management. Don't make me do it. <laughs> Seth, what are some updates that we have? Um, do we have any updates in the platform or anything that? Um... Yeah, so we a few weeks ago dropped our uh, new mobile app. That was recently had another update, I believe today or yesterday. And then we are QA testing Open Sprinkler. So that's finally getting close. I am very excited to set it up and have a fancy watering system at home. I have heard so many people asking about that in office hours. <laughs> so I know everyone's going to be really excited for when that drops. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, I need to see that open sprinkler. I know. I know. Yeah, I cannot wait. I feel the same way. I won't believe it till I see it, but it's coming. It's going to happen. I'm, I'm hopeful. And I've seen, I've seen the unit. I've seen the dashboard. It's, it, it exists. We just want to make sure that it's, you know, we're talking about irrigation control. That's something you don't want to have fail in any event, you know? So part of what we've done is instead of having a unit that, uh, like for instance, your, your open sprinkler now, once you connect it to Arroyo, will not need internet access. You won't need to port forward it. It's going to be connect, talking to your gateway through your local area network. And then your irrigation schedule is actually going to get it pushed from the gateway to the open sprinkler device and stored there. So if there was ever any reason that you lost internet, your plants are still going to get watered. If your gateway goes down, but your open sprinkler still has power, your plants are getting watered. So we just want to, you know, really make sure we've got all, all the holes covered in the software and uh, make sure that it's not going to fail. Oh, yeah, but that's super exciting. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Um, awesome. We had another question come in over on YouTube. So um, Diane wrote in again. What mineral should I... Um, what minute? Whoa, man. Sorry. I am. Um, my eyes are really bad right now. <laughs> okay. So first question, can you talk about LST during bulking and stretch? Sorry, another acronym for you. <laughs> so yeah, no, that one I, I know very well, low stress training. Um, it's great for a home grower. Uh, if you're doing it on a commercial application, you need to adjust how big you, your plants are when you flip them, your uh, topping techniques earlier on in veg and explore um, why your plants are getting too tall because it costs a lot of money to pay people to go in there and tuck branches under a screen. You know, typically uh, during early flower stretch, what I like to do is get my plants in, set my trellis up, usually two layers, and then let the plants grow up into that. I want to do as little touching and training as possible just because it's a labor, just because there's a labor aspect to it. On the flip side, uh, you know, for my own personal fun, I love low stress training. <laughs> I use twist thumbs and tie my branches down to the pot, get weird with it, you know, have fun, especially if you're growing, you know, in a, like an overhead space or a limited overhead space 
you know, there are, there are times where it does come into play. Um, if we're double stacked in a room, let's say, and we've got a plant count, so we got to keep those plants low, but we can increase our yields by upping density because we're into, into a plant count situation. That's where we might start saying, okay, we do want to start trying to train these plants, but everything, you know, has, uh, there's positives and negatives, right? If I also, I mean, harvest, I guess that's where we, what I'm trying to get to with low stress training. If I've got a plant totally scrogged out, which just means screen of green, you're tucking the branches into a grid. Um, that's really hard to harvest. <laughs> you know, you, you hit a point where you suddenly you're hanging plants and branches and you're just cutting the trellis to get it out of there. And, uh, if you've ever, which a lot of our customers have, I'm sure, um, taken down a harvest where you put like an extra layer or two of trellis on there, suddenly you got a nightmare trying to chop up branches and fish them out of there and then compound that with being in, let's say, I mean, most of my commercial cultivation experience was in Washington. We did not have to do individual plant weights. <laughs> we could do averages and total strain weights, weight in a bin, right? Majority of people in, you know, metric states are having to weigh plants individually. Think about the mechanics of getting it out of there when you've got it connected into, or not connected, but woven through so many nets. So not only are you, you know, losing labor money in going out there, bending branches under, um, you're also losing money because your harvest is going to take two to three times as long. Yeah. Yeah. Now, when you say it that way, I was like, yeah, it's a lot of work. Um, awesome. Diane also had a follow up question, too. So nitrogen or calcium, what mineral should I use in stretch and what do you recommend the ratio be? Sorry, can you repeat that? I looked at the pop up. Oh, no, 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 no. So, um, so in stretch, what? Which do you recommend that he use nitrogen or calcium and what ratio? Ratio of nitrogen to calcium. Generally speaking, I would use calcium nitrate as my nitrogen source during stretch and then really back off on it. Um, I, I don't know. Calcium nitrate's wonderful stuff. <laughs> I guess it's the best way to put that. There we go. Short and sweet. Um, awesome. You guys in the chats, uh, Welton, <laughs> Back to open sprinkler. Can we get a demo sneak peek? I don't know if we can give a demo of that right now. <laughs> but um, but well, yeah, Seth Seth covered some of the benefits. Do we have any other ones we can mention? Yeah, I don't have a dashboard I can show right now, but hopefully next week or the week after, Jason and I'll be on here uh, demonstrating how to set that up. Exciting. Um, Husky wrote in. Husky, do you want to take yourself off mute and ask Seth? I can definitely ask for you. I can ask for you. So Husky wants to know, how do you guys feel about under canopy lighting? Um, you know, I think there is some benefit to it. That being said, I've never looked into any research into how much of that light actually, you know, helps with photosynthesis. So one thing to think about, plants are highly evolved to take in light from above. So that's where most of our photosynthetic activity is happening. That being said, light still can get through to those chloroplasts from the bottom. It's just not as efficient. Um, personally, I would not implement something like that on a commercial scale just due to the cost and the fact that, um, every piece of equipment you buy has an EOL and end of life expectancy. And the more equipment you have to replace all the time, the more expensive your facility is going to be to run. Usually comes down to the bottom line, you guys. Awesome. Bilbo, do you want to go ahead and ask Seth your question? It looks like a discussion. Sure. Hey, Seth. Hey, Bubba. Hey, Mandy. I'm talking about that uh, substrate that is mm -hmm. 0.35 high CEC, 0.35 USG, high CEC, and we're steering in it, but the plants seem really, really hungry. And I'm wondering if at a 3% shot size, it's reasonable to just double it to a sixth and actually get some peaks. Uh, at the end of each irrigation right now, it, it, they look more like a bunch of turtles stacked on top of each other <laughs> instead of uh, the Rocky Mountains. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would double that up. Um, how, how big of a plant are you planning on finishing in that tiny of a pot? Um, well, they went into flower at 40 centimeters, roughly. Some were probably 45, 48. Okay. And we're four days in. So I estimate they'll finish at about a meter, maybe a meter and a half. Okay. Well, yeah. not a meter and a half. 
you're going to be putting a lot of water on those. As they oh, get we're, bigger, we're for sure. very well prepared for that. <laughs> okay. I agree. It's going to be, finishing is going to yeah. be very difficult right at the end. Um, just because yeah. you want to have a very big gas tank to drive your car with basically. Uh, yes, but we're on dosers and we have a uh, well-calculated and engineered irrigation supply. So I'm hoping that that doesn't bring true. <laughs> well, we'll see. Um, yeah. Uh, upping your shop size is okay. You're in uh, you're in Coco, right? I mean, 6% is fine. Cocoa usually can take up to about a 10% shop. No, you it's, get... it's, a, it's a cocoa blend. Okay. I would say the majority of the substrate is. Does it have perlite in it's it? It's cocoa, but there's also peat in there. So. Oh, okay. Gotcha. But no perlite. I'm sorry. I lost you for a second there, Bilbo. No, it looks like we're losing a connection. Oh no. Well, yeah, it's the perlite. Okay. Uh, if it's the perlite, I would watch it to make sure, like if you go to 6%, just watch to make sure you don't get any runoff before the irrigation's turned off. Does that make sense? So if you're looking at your graph and you're measuring it, if you know that you're able to achieve, let's say, with the perlite in there, 43% volumetric water capacity, volumetric water content for your field capacity, but you're seeing runoff and when you test it, you're only at 35%. That's a sign that you've got, you know, too much shot going on at once, too much water, too fast. Did you, did you say to monitor the actual irrigation event to ensure that runoff is not occurring while the event is going on? That's Potentially. Yeah. So that's, with. if your runoff occurs really early, like if you see runoff very early in your irrigation event, then you go test it and you're not getting above, like, let's say, like I said, if your field capacity is 43 and you're hitting 35, but getting runoff, that means the water's going on too fast. Well, while we're on the topic runoff in this substrate seems to be a, a varied answer. Uh, and in volume, you know, we do get a quantity of runoff because we calculate it to, attribute our success in irrigation but there's also the instance where you know i'm not totalizing the irrigation runoff for the room i'm only getting a snapshot that specific plant yeah so i know we do achieve runoff but it's a question of really is it one of these large runoff events that you would see in something with a low cec like a rock wall so yeah like it when we're talking about runoff i guess um you know really there's not a hard, fast rule about percentages to run. Uh, the easiest way to do it, honestly, is to have a graph and get really used to saying, okay, I put, because we can talk milliliters all day, but at the end of the day, you're operating your system in time, timed event duration. So you're going to get an intuitive feel and say, okay, I know about how much a one minute runtime is or a 30 second or a 15 second or a two or a five minute. And that's how you're going to be dialing this. So for me, the easiest way to get a handle on a new substrate is to apply an irrigation event, measure that runoff. Sure. Really though, look at how much drop in EC we have and see if that was too much or too little. If we're pushing too much runoff, your EC in the substrate is just going to bottom out at whatever your feed EC is, maybe a little lower. And that's what we want to avoid. But you do want to push a small amount of runoff every day and drain to waste just because we don't want an accumulation of positive ions in there that are going to drive the pH down. And also we always want to have a good balance of plant food in there. Um, if we have to, if the plants taken out all that it's going to take out and eat everything left behind is just not, not really that great. Does that answer? Cool, to, yeah. <laughs> if you need oh, yeah. a little more for sure. You know, like, yeah. yeah. I mean, we, the C, the, the the CEC I suspect is having an, a a wild effect on how our EC readings look in this substrate and in general at the facility as we're using the same substrate throughout. A little bit with cocoa and peat that mix though you shouldn't unless it was really salty to begin with if it wasn't washed you shouldn't see a high CEC like peat and cocoa are both like below one. That's a very I mean that was peat was the original soilless component right that was the original base for all soilless mixes until uh people decided that we shouldn't be strip mining peat bogs in canada yeah but the additives of this mix that we walked into oh, okay. 
as a group were were not uh, they were salty for sure and it was okay. unwashed so okay. i mean it, it's dynamic it's working yeah, that, but it's dynamic. Sure. does it have yeah. a like a mineral content that they tried to mix in oh yeah 100%. okay gotcha so yeah, yeah those are probably be issues you're dealing with and you might be running you know as a result a little lower feed ec and pushing a little more runoff just to uh try to flush that out a little bit see the last run that we did in this we there was a massive untimely event where it was hyper focused on the high cec in the substrate so i ended up flushing out the media for what seemed like a week and retarding the 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 whole harvest group by a substantial length of time gotcha. so this time we've gone in smaller uh substrate size and then not done that whole phase of flushing out the substrate so gotcha. I, I agree with what you're saying and slightly larger shots may get me back in that more uh in more of those inversions that we're so used to seeing yeah. in the graphs yep yep absolutely go for it and uh yeah honestly i would probably gravitate away from a mix like that if i was feeding salts um the soil mixes are great but honestly i i get great results with straight cocoa if that's what you're, you know, you're looking for more of a soil than a rock wall. So, so as a, a economizer by nature, um, our facility has a deluge of it. So we'll basically be using it <laughs> for the foreseeable future okay. until it's gone. Gotcha. No, I, I, I know that. I know a lot of people who have bought several shipping containers of Hugo's and then found that like, well, what the hell do we do with these things? Are we going to buy slabs? Are we going to, you know, so I feel you, um, you'll just have to adapt, you know, probably switch, maybe flip smaller plants in them. It's, it's tough to say if you're not having a problem finishing with the genetics that you have and maintaining, you know, good tw tight nug structure in the last two, three weeks, I'd say you're rocking it. You know, there's, there's really no hard and fast rules that I could say you, sir, are going to fail because I think you're probably doing okay. You're just probably watering a lot. And that's a more yeah. of a logistical issue sometimes than anything else. We have definitely taken care of the logistical challenge then, your so. <laughs> then you're solid. And yeah, I just keep blasting through yeah. those and probably avoid growing like any, any tall stretchy strains or anything that's advertised as like a 10 or an 11 week strain. Just stay away yeah. from stuff that's going to be finicky and stick with, you know, stuff that's short and tough and you'll be fine. No PGRs there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Bilbo. It's always so great to see you. Um, we got a couple different uh, comments over on YouTube. So follow up to LST. Diane wanted to know, do you have any advice about LST leaf surface temperature? That's what he was asking about. <laughs> yeah, there's so many acronyms. 82 degrees, 80 degrees. Um, basically, when we're talking about temperatures, we want its leaf surface temperature that we're trying to target. And so one thing to be definitely aware of is like when we're talking about HPS versus the sun versus LED, we've got different amounts of radiant energy that are emitted by all of those. So when we're looking at, say, an HPS, if the room's 82, that leaf surface temp might be like 86, 87. Um, on an LED, if the room's 82, that leaf surface temp might be 77, just because we're not transmitting as much energy from the light source in the form of heat or radiant heat to the plant. So... Uh, in, in terms of leaf surface temp, that's where you want to start when it comes to dialing your HVAC system. Get a laser thermometer. doesn't have to be a super fancy one. And just start taking some leaf surface temperatures. You know, once you start seeing a leaf go above 85, 86, that's when we would say that you're, you're starting to push it a little hard. You might start seeing some uh, fox tailing in your buds, late flower stretch, things like that. Awesome. Thanks for um, clarifying that a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I hadn't heard that. I hadn't heard anything about low stress training in a while. So I was like, huh. every once in a while it comes up. Covering all the topics today. Um, also, Diane wanted to know if you could give him a little bit more information about psychrometric charts. Uh, honestly, not off the top of my head. I'd have to pull those up. Do we have any resources that we recommend for that? Um, probably start looking towards some of Apogee stuff. Um, Bruce Bugby is kind of the leading authority on light in plants right now. So that's usually where I start when I'm looking at that. Perfect. Awesome. Well, that is like the final question that we have over on YouTube for now. Um, anyone else in the chat? Do you guys have any questions? Cause we're getting close to the end of our show. Do 
I do want to make sure that we get to everyone's questions that we cover all the topics. Seth, like I, I, I would love to just like talk about like some growing, um, I don't know. Like I like to get existential sometimes. <laughs> okay. Okay. It, 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 let's just get weird here. Since yeah. we have some time with you, if you guys have some questions, go ahead and drop them in the chat. But um, I have some questions that I'd like to ask Seth. Yeah. Like personally, as a grower, as a cultivator, like what are some, what are some things that like keep you going and inspire you to like always kind of push the bounds as a cultivator? Cause this is hard work. Um, you know, it, it feels like there's a lot of, you know, um, obstacles for certain people to get into this, but like, but just what really got you into this? Uh, hmm. I guess honestly, my background in plant science and then, uh, I like growing plants in general. Um, I had, when it comes to like crop steering and really pushing the envelope on getting performance out of these plants, that's entirely motivated by money. <laughs> Personally, if you look at my gardens at home, inside or outdoors, uh, they're, they're a lot more, uh, I don't do organic inside, but I, I go organic outside of my garden because it's cheap and I can just, you know, work throughout the year to maintain my compost, get the additives I need to amend my soil. Good to go. Indoors, I keep it simple, you know. Um, if I'm looking to produce to make money, I'm going to be pushing it. If not, I'm going to relax on a few things and make it easy on myself. And also those two things aren't mutually exclusive. You can push your plants pretty hard so long as you've got, um, all of your events timed just right. You know, if you've, if you're flipping the perfect size plant for your media and that happens to finish at the perfect height for your light setting and you've got your HVAC dialed. Um, yeah, pushing your plants isn't any harder than not pushing them. Now, on the other hand, if the HVAC system can't keep up and we're always going to be carting dehues in and out and, you know, making extra work for ourselves, that's uh, not that exciting to me. Like I said, the, the main motivation for pushing it, I think for most growers is bigger yields and that equates to more money. And right now um, I'm passionate about it because I love helping a lot of these producers that are struggling to stay in the market. Um, you know, for them, the difference is if I can't get another pound per light, we're going out of business. And to me, that's a pretty strong driver too. I love seeing those success stories where people worked hard, built up a business, and then actually, you know, found some success and reward for doing that. That's what it's all about, isn't it? Absolutely. That's awesome. That's awesome. What are you growing right now? Uh, well, right now I just moved. <laughs> so I, all my stuff is down. Uh, let me think. I did grow some DJ short blueberry a little while back. One of my buddies here has been growing the pure Michigan pretty hard. So that's always fun to get a cut of. And then, uh, yeah, I, I like to mix it up, honestly, whatever I can get my hands on usually. Yeah. Those sound like fun cultivars. Mm -hmm. Um, we did get a couple more questions over on YouTube, so I'll get to those really quickly. Uh, Donald wants to know, this is probably a really quick question. LEDs or HPS? Uh, all depends on your budget and how expensive power is and uh, what what your total situation is. If you are in a licensed facility situation and you can afford the LEDs, go for it. However, if you built a grow room and you uh, planned on having HPS, LEDs aren't only going to be more expensive per fixture, but they're also going to require more dehumidification and heating capacity potentially in the winter. So. There are trade-offs. On the other hand, with those HPSs, you know, every minute they're on, they're losing a tiny bit of intensity. So, you know, they're pretty, have a pretty limited lifespan compared to the LEDs, but they do put out heat and help deal with humidity in grow rooms. So I think it's grower's preference. You just have to realize the caveats of like, yeah, I got to replace my bulbs every year at the most, you know, and then LEDs, if you lock into those, um, do your research, make a good investment, try to buy something that, uh, you know, has some tried and true technology, maybe is on the cutting edge, but don't, don't be surprised if in a year you feel like you've got obsolete technology right now. <laughs> and guess what? You don't, there's just a lot of, a lot of marketing going on and a lot of, a lot of strides being made, but you know, whether you've got some awesome, you know, brand new full spectrum LEDs with, far red supplementation in UV, or you've got the classic blurples. They all grow, <laughs> they all grow, they all grow cannabis and the HPS, they still work great. Like I said, they're just a higher service item. Awesome. Thank you for that. Uh, we had one more question come in through YouTube. Diane wants to know, um, 
Where should my trichomes be before harvest? Should they be more milky or amber? Uh, so typically the progression is clear, milky, and then amber. Um, a good way to kind of think about this is start looking at your testing. If you've got uh, like a really high THCA content, lower THC, you're probably still at that clear to milky stage. When we hit amber, you start to see a little bit more THC, you know, a little more decarboxylation. It's turned from THC into THCA into THC, the final end of that uh, biochemical pathway. Awesome. Thank you for that. Well, that actually wrapped up all of the questions that we had over on YouTube. Um, if anyone else has any other questions, um, yeah, I guess we're pretty much wrapping up here. Um, Seth, what's going on for you for the rest of the summer? You got any other plans or? Oh boy. Just, uh, just, you know, first time homeowner stuff. Oh, fun. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Um, other than that, no, nothing too crazy. No normal nice. stuff finish. I didn't get to put in much of a garden this year, so harvest the few bits of tomatoes and potatoes I got <laughs> where I was That's staying. Nice. Yeah. What about you? Um, Oh, I'm actually going to get to take some time off to visit family up in Arkansas for a little bit. So oh, yeah, cool. get out of Texas, get out of the heat for a little bit. Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so grateful for it. Absolutely. Well, yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess uh, if that is it, um, thank you guys for coming to the show. We'll go ahead and wrap up. Thank you, Seth, for everything today. Um, and everyone else who um, was new to the chat, please stick around for a minute so we can co uh, collect your contact info to send you a new Arroyo hat if you did ask a question. Um, thank everyone for joining us for this week's office hours. We do this every Thursday. The best way to get answers from our experts is to join us live, as you can see here. Um, so if you have questions for, about Arroyo, we do invite you to go ahead and book a demo with our experts like Seth and Jason. They can go ahead and tell you about how the platform can be used to improve your cultivation production process. But as always, you can let us know there's, if there's a topic you'd like to see covered on office hours. Um, you can just go ahead and post it in the chat. You can shoot us an email at support.arroya at metergroup.com or just go ahead and send us an Instagram DM. We'd always love to hear from you. We record every session and we'll be emailing everyone in attendance a link from the video from today's discussion. It'll also be over on our YouTube channel. So like and subscribe while you're over there. And if you do find these conversations helpful, please feel free to share with your network and spread the word. We'll see you guys next time. Thanks so much, you guys.